Hello everybody, and welcome to Insider's Guide. Today, we're wrapping up our discussion of Kirkwood. For this part, I will cover the terrain in the remaining parts of the resort, including Cables Crest, Vista Ridge, and the backside. If you haven't already, go check out part A to get some great background on Kirkwood. So with that, let's continue in Insider's Guide to Ski Resorts, Kirkwood. Let's take a brief break from talking about the expert terrain and talk about Chair 2, Cables Crest. Chair 2 is most directly accessed via Chair 1, but can also be accessed via the Cables Crest Traverse off Chair 11 and Eagle Bowl off Chair 10. Chair 2 specializes in short, wide-open intermediate cruisers, but is used by most as a means of getting to the backside of the mountain. Chair 2 is the only way to get to the backside, and because of this, it's always a bit busy. Bark Shanty and Flying Carpet are the two signature runs in the pod and are both pretty fun. You can also cut skiers left under the Vista Cliffs to access Scott's Run, a rarely groomed intermediate run that has a few fun goalies and rollers. The run skiers right of Cable's Crest are often skied less often, and they can be a nice way to escape the crowds on a busy day. Juniper is an intermediate glade run, and Whiskey Slide is a road that leads to Low Whiskey and High Whiskey. The Whiskies are two bull runs that are really nice runs to end the day on. High Whiskey is one of the easier blacks at Kirkwood, and is my preferred way down this area, as it's a bit steeper, longer, and more wide open than Low Whiskey. These runs will drop you below Chair 2, so you'll have to ride Chair 1 first to get back to Chair 2. Note that this section right before the bottom terminal of Chair 2 is a bit uphill, so you'll have to keep your speed if you're trying to get back to Mountain Village. One of my biggest annoyances with Kirkwood is the placement of the Vista T-Bar. Although the terrain it serves is awesome, the geniuses who built it decided that guests should be forced to hike a bit to get to it. In addition, the T-Bar itself runs semi-infrequently, and if that's the case, you'll likely have to hike the full Vista Ridge, which is not worth it unless there's been a recent dump. Note that this is another part of the trail map that's not to scale, as there's a huge unmarked cliff-riddled face directly adjacent to and below the Vista T-Bar known as Vista. This is a great part of the mountain to work on your freeriding skills, as there are several really unique and interesting lines through this zone. Past Vista, you'll find these expert shoots from Shot 5 to Two Man Shoot. Shot 5 and Boilermaker are the only shoots in this zone that are accessible directly from the Vista T Bar. Shot 5 is a really cool couloir, and Boilermaker is an interesting shoot that's guarded by trees on one side and rocks on the other. Like all the expert terrain at Kirkwood, none of these runs are well marked, so you'll have to memorize your line. On the other side of Vista, you'll get the chance to drop into some wide open terrain that contains the marked sunny side and unmarked coyote runs. I don't really recommend this terrain as it tends to get sunbaked really badly and these runs are particularly rocky. Chair 3 is mainly used as an egress to get out of the backside. The runs that it services are really mediocre and short. The chairlift itself is a very uncomfortable double with really weird cushions. Because of these factors, I highly, highly recommend not spending too much time here. Deadwood Spur is a fun little tree run and Button Bull is a nice wide open area right underneath some monster cliffs. Both runs lead into this flat run, Bud's Alley. These are probably the best runs off this lift, but they also get pretty sunbaked. Herringbone Straight and Easy Rider are two pretty average blue runs that are only used to get to Chair 4. Make sure to head skiers right about halfway down Herringbone Straight to make it to Chair 4. If you take either run all the way down to Chair 3, you won't be able to get to Chair 4. Also, keep your speed up towards the bottom. It's extremely flat. That brings us to arguably the best lift on this side of the mountain, Chair 4, Sunrise. Sunrise is a fixed grip quad that essentially services all of the backside terrain at Kirkwood. This terrain is heavily exposed and is usually the last terrain to open at Kirkwood during a storm day. Patrol typically opens terrain from lookers right to left. Although the terrain it services is amazing, in my experience, Chair 4 consistently generates the longest lines at the resort. This, combined with its excruciatingly lengthy ride time, makes lapping the Sunrise pod a bit painful. It's really best to head here first thing in the day as soon as patrol opens it. For the Sunrise Pod, we'll first look at the runs on the looker's left side of the chair, and then the runs on the looker's right side. Note that just like Chair 10, Chair 4 sits up top a very narrow ridge, so plan which direction you're heading before you get off the lift in order to make space for others. Sunrise specializes in a wide variety of high alpine terrain for guests of intermediate and above proficiency. If you're an intermediate skier, you'll want to head to Sunrise for the best blue cruisers on the mountain. Note that these two blues are also the hardest blues at the resort and would most likely be blacks elsewhere. Elevator Shaft is my favorite of the two blue runs in this zone. It's very steep and allows you to build up some serious speed. All of the runs directly under Chair 4 mellow out a bit after their initial pitch, so retain some speed. If you head directly under the lift line, you'll come to the unmarked Hollywood zone. 
Hollywood is a cliff area that has a variety of short drops and straight lines. There is an unmarked blue catwalk that goes around Hollywood if you decide to bail. Skiers left of Hollywood only requires a cornice drop, but the lines further skiers right require a combination of straight lining and cliff drops. This area is pretty low consequence, however, and is a great place to work on your skills. Hollywood eventually merges onto the flat, lower elevator shaft, which you can take all the way back to the bottom of the lift. Happiness Is is a much wider run than elevator shaft and is the first of several runs in this massive bowl. It is groomed, although slightly more infrequently than elevator shaft, and is a whole lot of fun to ride. This is also a great run to scope out the runs further skiers right. The Wave is a legendary run at Kirkwood, whose cornice is shaped like a wave due to high wind gusts. This is a great first cornice to attempt since past the drop-in, the bowl isn't that steep and is very low consequence, hence why it's rated single black. You can also customize your drop-in to match your ability level, as the size of the cornice varies tremendously throughout this bowl. Like I mentioned earlier, Kirkwood's a genuinely great mountain to work your way up to extreme terrain. Going back to the wave, look out for avalanche debris at the bottom of the bowl as you filter back onto happiness is. Past the wave, the ridge, known as Covered Wagon Ridge, starts sloping upwards. If you sidestep up a bit, you'll reach Upper Devil's Draw. Like the wave, Upper Devil's Draw requires a cornice drop into a wide open bowl, but the run filters into Devil's Draw instead of happiness is. Devil's Draw has a few really fun rock drops on the side of the run and is always ungroomed. If you decide to do so, you can hike around 15 minutes to the summit of Covered Wagon Peak, which is the ski area boundary. You'll be greeted with absolutely fantastic views of the surrounding wilderness and backcountry. For reference, the backcountry terrain off the neighboring Melissa Corre Peak is Jackson Hole backcountry level. If you know, you know. Directly off the summit of Covered Wagon Peak is the epic run Covered Wagon, a high alpine face that usually holds untracked snow. Right below Covered Wagon is Fawn Ridge, a glade area that can also be reached without hiking all the way to the summit of Covered Wagon Peak. I wouldn't say that Kirkwood is a resort that specializes in tree terrain, unlike its sister resorts North Star and Heavenly, but Fawn Ridge is a very good glade area. This is a much larger and more densely gladed area than it appears on the trail map. On a day with less than ideal conditions, this is the place to be, as the snow here can go untracked for days. Unless you duck a rope, all the terrain off Covered Wagon Peak and Fawn Ridge will filter back down to Chair 4. Now, to talk about the terrain lookers right at the lift. As soon as you get off the lift, there's a gate that'll allow you to hike up to the top of Thimble Peak and ski down a very special run called 99 Steps. This hike is quite steep and long, but it pretty much guarantees a few fresh turns after a storm. Just watch out for traverse tracks below. To get to these three runs, Holy Gully, Cold Shoulder, and Larry's Lip, you'll have to take a very flat traverse. Holy Gully is exactly what the name implies and is one of the mellower gullies at Kirkwood. Cold Shoulder is an awesome run that's left ungroomed in the early season and is groomed more frequently in the core season. This is one of my favorite groomers at Kirkwood, and it has a very steep final section that's really fun to fly down. Larry's Lip is a very wide bowl that doesn't get much attention. There's an unnamed gully on the skier's right side of the run. If you take the gully, you'll come to a very cool low-angle chute known as Lion's Mouth. Lion's Mouth goes between two large rocks and is a great first chute to try at Kirkwood. This chute will lead back down to lower elevator shaft. Larry's Lip can be used to access Sunnyside, but its primary purpose is to provide access to the runs from Corner Chute to Hell's Delight. Just like the representation of the terrain under the Vista T-Bar, this part of the map is not to scale. Hell's Delight is one of the most challenging marked double black diamond trails at Kirkwood and is located right next to the Cirque boundary. Hell's Delight is more of a zone than a specific run and is very challenging to find if you're not explicitly looking for it. There are two primary ways of skiing this zone, skiers left and skiers right. Skier's Left is an ultra-steep chute with a very precipitous choke in the middle of the run that mandates some very precise jump turns. Skier's Right involves some mandatory drops but isn't as steep as Skier's Left. The middle part of Hell's Delight flattens out a bit before plunging into a steep finale. Hell's Delight filters onto the epic lower half of Thunder Saddle. Note that there's actually a significant amount of terrain between Hell's Delight and Thunder Saddle that's not depicted on the trail map. This area is known as the Soul Searcher Zone and it has several unmarked cliffs and straight lines. Thunder Saddle is the only run suitable for advanced skiers in this zone. The top portion of Thunder Saddle is cool, but where the run really shines is in its lower section. It's not visible on the trail map, but the second half of the run is a gully that's surrounded by the towering cirque on the left and a gigantic cliff on the right. It's rare for rock defined chutes to be accessible to advanced skiers, but Thunder Saddle is just that. If you're advanced, this is a must do run. Below Thunder Saddle on the map are a series of unmarked cliffs and spines. The most notorious run here is known as the handrail. The handrail is a spine that's only as wide as your ski's length. 
It involves several mini drops where you barely go down this ridiculous spine with huge drops on either side. This is one of the most intimidating and exposed runs on the mountain. The handrail creates two unnamed chutes on either side, both of which are really fun. They're great opportunity to scope out if the handrail itself is unskiable. Past the entrance into Thunder Saddle are the gleated one-man chute and two-man chute. If you're looking for the tamest double black diamonds on the mountain, along with False Peak Chute, these two chutes are your best bet. They aren't very exposed or steep, but they still hold some really nice, often untracked snow. Bogey Slide and Corner Chute require some brief uphill sidestepping to reach, but are some of the more challenging chutes in this area. They're both quite steep and have more obstacles than either one-man or two-man chute. All of these runs in the Thunder Saddle Zone require you to egress via the Ultra Flat and Long Devil's Corral area. To get back to these runs, you'll have to take Chair 2, ski down to Chair 4, and then take Chair 4 up for another lap. This makes it a bit egregious to lap this zone, but it's one of the least traffic parts of Kirkwood. If you have the ability to ski these runs and are looking to get out of the backside at the end of the day, I highly, highly recommend exiting via these runs rather than skiing down to Chair 3. Alright, that about wraps it up for Kirkwood. If you haven't already, go check out parts A, B, and C to hear about the rest of Kirkwood. Or, go check out another episode of Insider's Guide, all about other fine resorts around the West. As always, please leave any questions down below. Thank you all so much for watching. All my love, I'm out.